atrocious. This is so terrible. I'm, I'm sorry. And so just in closing, I'm going to say, look, it's not whether we find each other. It's not like forming little sects. It's whether we feed each other. It's whether we take care of each other. And instead of this, uh, uh, you know, whether we're all bound together by friendship, we have to think about communities who have nothing in common. Yeah, we have to spread well-being to everyone. So that's, that's what I'm Um, I will. I have a, a slightly different perspective from, uh, with regard to the first uh, uh, talk. So I think that we have we will have the opportunity to have a real discussion. Um, on May 1992, anarchist groups from different countries took part in the international anarcho-feminist meeting organized in Paris by the Women Commission of the Fédération Anarchiste Française. Among the tasks take up at this meeting was the attempt to define what exactly anarcho-feminism stands for. As noticed in one of the preparatory contributions to this meeting, developing a feminist and anarchist thought had as a name the feminization of the libertarian movement, the introduction within the anarchist movement of different deeply egalitarian practices, but also the anarchization of feminist practices via the refusal of the totalitarianism of sisterhood. This refusal, therefore, implied naming the political differences which divide the feminist movement. By stressing the necessity of breaking the totalitarianism of sisterhood, the meeting was taking a critical stance with regard to some recent de developments of second wave feminism, especially to the second wave's co-optation by political parties, state and institutions, its concealment of class and race differences behind the notion of universal sisterhood, and most fundamentally, its incapacity to establish, to establish a political and theoretical bond between a critique of male power and the denunciation of the state as the patriarchal institution par excellence. With the critique of the conception of the feminist movement as a unified totality held together by some kind of automatic solidarity of interest among women, the meeting consistently tried to promote the necessity of defining in a far clearer way the theoretically theoretical and political profile of anarcho-feminism as a specific current. The international anarcho-feminist meeting's effort at self-definition and its published expression of a differentiation from other feminist currents tried to make good of the, on the striking delay in the theoretical development of anarchist feminist thought. Looking at some writings on women's condition and emancipations uh, by authors like Emma Goldman or Voltaire de Clare, one can find surprisingly modern analysis and political positions which anticipate second wave feminism from several viewpoints. It appears, however, that in the following de decades, these elements have not been theoretically developed within the anarchist movement. Of course, the reasons of this under theorization are numerous and have to do with both the political marginalization suffered by anarchism and with the resistance often offered by the anarchist movement itself to the autonomous organization and political elaboration of women. What I would like to suggest in this paper is, on the one hand, that the impact of second wave feminism on the anarchist movement in the 70s should be included among the main reasons of the delay in the theoretical development of anarcho-feminism. And on the other hand, that anarcho-feminism should be thought today in relation to the recent developments in ecofeminist, materialist, and queer theory. In what follows, I will briefly point out the peculiar aspects of the critique of women's oppression in Emma Goldman's and Walter de Clare's articles, and the way in which these aspects coalesce to produce an original view which anticipates second wave feminism. I will then focus on a series of articles written in the 70s on the specific question of the relation between anarchism and feminism. And finally, I will delineate the new challenges raised by feminist theory for the theoretical development of anarchist feminism today. In this way, I hope to help elucidate the question of the specificity of anarcho-feminism 
in the context of the flourishing of gender and sexuality theories from the 70s onwards. So, first part, Emma Goldman and Voltaire Declare. Um, in Goldman's and de Clare's articles on women's liberation, it is possible to find a very peculiar combination of three elements. First, a class perspective on women's condition. Second, a critique of emancipationist feminism, particularly with regard to the question of suffrage and of the economic equal opportunities. And third, a focus on sexual liberation and the develop, development of a critique of bourgeois morality and its institutions. The article The Traffic in Women, in which Goldman articulates her anti-prohibitionist position on prostitution, combines together class analysis, denunciation of the sexual reification of women, and critique of bourgeois morality. While she explains the phenomenon of prostitution as having its origin in class exploitation and poverty, Goldman denounces the hypocrisy of bourgeois society displayed in prohibitionist policies. The public condemnation of prostitution is hypocritical, firstly because it is a facet of the very system of class exploitation on which bourgeois society relies, for bourgeois society creates the increased necessity of prostitution as a means for survival for the women it economically exploits. Secondly, because the primary other option open to economically disenfranchised women, that is the institution of marriage, is nothing but the legal ratification of an economic transition which compels women to offer sexual services in exchange for a living. From this point of view, mar marriage is not particularly different from other, for other forms of prostitution which are morally and legally condemned by society. Thirdly and finally, prohibitionism is hypocritical because it conceals the fact that prostitution is itself thinkable only as a result of the sexual objectification of women, an objectification that lies at the very root of a social and patriarchal division of gender roles. I quote Goldman, Nowhere is woman treated according to the merit of her work, but rather as a sex. It is therefore almost inevitable that she should pay for her right to exist, to keep a position in whatever line, with sex favors, end of quote. In two articles on suffragism and emancipationist feminism, Woman's suffrage, suffrage and the Tragedy of Woman's Emancipation, Goldman endorses a class perspective in order to underline the constitutive limits of suffragist demands within the liberal feminist movement. <coughs> Combined with the demand of economic equal opportunities, idea of the possibility of choosing a career, suffragism contributes to the illusion of the possibility of a full emancipation of women within a society based on class exploitation and domination. It is particularly in her critique of a narrow view of emancipationism and of the effects that this has on the concrete li lives of women that Goldman anticipates the critique of emancipationist feminism which will be developed several decades later in second wave feminism. Goldman shows, at a very early stage, how emancipationism makes the mistake of thinking that what is needed is nothing more than independence from external tyrannies, while the internal tyrants are problematically left in their place. The result is that in a situation in which the totality of social and human relations remains unchanged, the emancipated woman is pushed to become a vestal and to sacrifice her desires and the possible develop development of a free and authentic sexuality for the sake of her independence. Both De Clare and Goldman point out how the sexual division of labor, social conventions, institutions like marriage, public morality, normative motherhood, all contribute to block the free development of women as human beings. The result of this process is a mutilated human being, one who is made dependent, reckless, cowardly, sexually repressed, unable to struggle, and lacking social consciousness. What we are accustomed to calling a woman is the result of this set of social conventions, rules and institutions which, in addition to exerting an external pressure, have been interiorized. Through this process, the possible horizon for the development of women's human nature has been dramatically curtailed. The presupposition here is that there are a human nature and a sexuality given before power relations, 
but which have been oppressed and mutilated by the social conditions of domination and exploitation. And I will try to problematize exactly this point later on. Um, Goldman's and Declare's view on women's liberation, with its combination of the three elements I quoted above, class perspective, critique of emancipationism, and centrality of the question of sexuality, occupied an original position with regard to both liberal emancipationist feminism and socialist feminism. In other words, the seeds of anarcho-feminist thought distinguished from other feminist currents were already present. The flourishing of the second wave feminism in the 60s and 70s contributed, in my opinion, to blocking the growth of these seeds instead of encouraging it. Under several aspects, second wave feminism appeared to anarchist authors and activists to be a sort of practical application of anarchist organizational principles. <coughs> its refusal of leadership and hierarchy, its critique of centralism, centralism and delegation, its support of small size groups, and its willingness to strongly relate public and private, all contributed to blunting critique from an anarchist di direction. The question of organizational forms and of the strong solidarity between radical feminism and anarchist feminism is the central topic in, a, in the few more theoretical anarcho-feminist writings of the 70s, particularly in the States. I'm referring here in particular to a set of, of essays that appeared between 1974 and 1979 in magazines like Aurora, Second Wave and Black Rose. Peggy Corneger's Anarchism, the Feminist Connection, Lynn Farrow's Feminism as Anarchism, Marianne Layton's Anarcho-Feminism, and Carol Ehrlich's Socialism, Anarchism, and Feminism. The shared assumption of these writings was the existence of a natural affinity between the feminist movement, particularly in its radical version, and anarchism. <coughs> Whereas for Lynn Farrow, I quote, feminism practices what anarchism preaches, for Peggy Corniger, it wasn't only the case that the feminist movement contributed to libertarian thought, but further, feminists have been unconscious anarchists in both theory and practice for years, and needed only to become aware of the natural connection between anarchism and radical feminism. This unconscious anarchism revealed itself first in the concrete ways in which the feminist movement was organized. Second, the unconscious trend toward anarchism was evidenced in the critique of the male domineering attitude and the, of the hierarchical subordination of both sensuality to rationality, intuition to mind. The emphasis on the natural affinity between radical feminism and anarchism led Corniger, Farrow, Leighton and Ehrlich to slightly different conclusions. For Farrow, what the feminists were doing was exactly what they were supposed to do not having a program, not elaborating these social narratives, having concrete community-based projects, that is, not planning a revolution. In a manifestation of suspicion of male-dominated, uh, I quote, logics and its rituals, she endorsed a blanket anti-intellectualistic position, claiming that women do not have interest in, the, in theoretical assumptions at all. For Corniger, the point was recognizing the necessity to verbalize the subsurface anarchism underlying the feminist movement. Only after the recognition of its unconscious anarchist roots could feminism legitimately proclaim itself the ultimate revolution. A similar view was suggested by Leighton, a founding member of Black Rose in 